to continue, we have uh, to Professor Enrique Fernandez Cara introduce to Professor Juan Carlos de los Reyes. You can start, Enrique. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much to uh, Juan Carlos for having accepted this uh, uh, invitation to participate in our seminar. Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly present him. He's the founding director of the Research Center for Mathematical Modeling, MODEMAT, in Ecuador, and is full professor in that center of optimization and control. He has worked in a lot of universities in Germany, US, and our countries, and is a very well-known uh, specialist in optimization and control, also several books and a lot of papers of high-level uh, journals. So today he is going to uh, give the talk here. Uh, I repeat that thank you very much for your participation. Uh, on bilevel learning for inverse problems. So you can start uh, as you want. Okay, well, let me start by thanking uh, Enrique for the introduction and thanking also Juan for the for the invitation to to give a talk in the in this seminar. Uh, this is actually a joint work uh, with several colleagues along the last 10 years. Uh, the the first two of them, are PhD students of mine, and the other ones are collaborators in, in many universities around the globe. So the, the topic is about uh, bi-level learning for inverse problems. It's uh, more uh, an inverse problems optimization talk uh, rather than a, a PDE talk, uh, but it has some, some features that are quite related to, to what happens with partial differential equations. So, um, let me start with this uh, with this graphic, this very general uh, setting where you can observe uh, what's happening with the artificial intelligence uh, sort of revolution that we are living right now. And uh, in this uh, in this graphic, you can observe that uh, machine learning uh, is a subset of this artificial intelligence, and it encompasses uh, many techniques that are quite uh, well known for mathematicians like support vector machines. Uh, linear and logistic regression, k-means, and, and so on. And uh, in this uh, part of machine learning, you have also the, the so-called neural networks, and uh, a part of these neural networks are uh, deep learning. So there are a lot of techniques, and this is, uh, this is quite the, the message of the, of the graphic. There are a lot of techniques that are uh, involved in machine learning, but are not uh, specifically related to neural networks. Um, what's happening with deep learning in general, uh, and this is uh, well known nowadays, and it's uh, almost everybody's using this, uh, these techniques and these tools, is that deep learning is very efficient at handling complex tasks. Uh, we've seen in the talk before uh, how these deep learning techniques are used also for uh, considering very complicated PDE models. And uh, in general, the deep learning techniques uh, require uh, massive data uh, for, for training basically the models. And the main drawback of uh, deep learning is the lack of interpretability. So this is not a problem, for instance, if we are uh, working with a language model where we can uh, chat with a, with a machine or which we can chat and, and ask again and, and, and get a feedback which is different. But it can be very critical in, in applications like uh, self-driving cars, medical diagnosis, uh, and so on. So uh, there is no explainable uh, deep learning models in many of the cases, and that makes it difficult to, to consider those in critical applications. So um, the idea of bi-level learning, and I'm, I'm trying to convince or will try to convince that, uh, that this is actually a a topic in a field that it's uh, it's light, lies in between what's happening with the uh, deep learning and what's happening with other machine learning techniques. And the advantage of uh, bi-level learning, as I will present, is related to the fact that the models that are considered are explainable. And um, this explainability comes at a certain price. And the price is actually that we have to investigate very thoughtfully the mathematical models that are involved in the phenomenon. 
And in this talk specifically, the mathematical models uh, are related to so-called inverse problems uh, that we, we consider. So um, let me start with a very general setting uh, of what an inverse problem is about. And this is a, actually a very, very common, uh, very common setting is a frequent is one where uh, you have uh, some corrupted data and you want to recover uh, a solution U that is perturbed by a so-called forward operator. And what you observe is actually this, uh, this corrupted data or this corrupted signal or image or solution, which is uh, the effect of perturbing the ideal solution that you want to recover and adding some specific type of noise. So um, this T operator uh, models actually the relation that is involved uh, between uh, the solution, the ideal solution you want to recover and the corrupted data that you can observe. And of course, incorporates the dynamics of the model if, if that's the case in a physical system. Now, typically, uh, T has an unbounded inverse and the, the problem becomes ill-posed in, in such a way that there is not a direct uh, manner or way to recover the solution out of this frequentist uh, equation. So typically, what it's, uh, what it's done in inverse problems with different techniques is uh, you incorporate to the inverse problem some a priori information you may have uh, about the solution to try to recover a unique solution uh, that it's, uh, is helping you to, to, to move on. So uh, this is basically called the regularization uh, technique in inverse problems. And we are going to, to see uh, what's happening with a specific uh, kind of, uh, of technique, which is called the variational approach. And in the variational approach for inverse problems, what you do is actually you consider, uh, instead of the frequentist uh, equation from before, you consider an energy model that you have to minimize. So you have an energy that incorporates two terms. The first one is the a priori information you may have about the solution. So this incorporates, for instance, if you know that the, that the solution is a piecewise constant solution, so this is valuable information that you can incorporate in the in the energy model uh, using a certain a certain term, but you can also incorporate, for instance, uh, some smoothness uh, condition that you may know about the solution. And a part of that, you have the second term, which is provided in this uh, right-hand side, which is called the data fidelity term. And uh, this term is responsible for forcing uh, the minimizer to obey the forward model, but it's also responsible for uh, modeling the type of noise that is incorporated in the signal that you can observe or the, or the corrupted data that you can observe. So uh, you have two elements uh, differently from before. You have a prior, a regularizing term, you have a data model, and you have a part of that, this uh, parameter or hyperparameter lambda, that it's balancing one against the other. So depending on how this lambda is chosen, then the solutions may vary uh, significantly uh, for this same type of energy. So, if, of course, it depends quite heavily if uh, you consider a, a specific type of prior, as I mentioned before, but also the data model, uh, the physical model that is involved in the phenomena, and of course, the choice of the hyperparameters that you want to, to consider for getting a better solution. So let me uh, briefly explain some applications uh, in this context. Uh, this is, for instance, a typical image denoising task. And in the image denoising task, what you have is uh, the F here is the corrupted image with noise. is basically the one that it's on the left-hand side. And uh, what you want to do is you, find, you want to find the, the solution U that approaches this uh, corrupted data or this noisy image. By, but at the same time, you consider a regularization term, which is it has the form of the total variation in this specific example. And the total variation is responsible typically for, a, for forcing a, the solution to, to be piecewise constant. A, we will see that in a while, but the, this is what it, a, it forces or it promotes. So in this case, for instance, you can observe that on the left-hand side, you have an image which is under-regularized, and on the right hand side, you have an over regularized image. And that means uh, lambda is quite large in this part. 
but in the center you have a balanced uh, image that is obtained with a with an optimal value of this parameter lambda that you have to choose. A part of that, uh, you have, for instance, this example of what happens in uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging. And uh, in this type of machines, if you consider uh, the sample of the K space and you sample the full K space, then you can obtain a better reconstruction of the image. But this comes at a price, and the price is that the patient has to be uh, quite a lot of time in the machine. Uh, and this is not precisely a desirable uh, feature uh, for selling the, the type of solutions of the MRI. So what it's typically done is uh, it considers, or MRI machines considers, consider algorithms that subsample the KS space and obtain a solution that is related to this subsample, some sampling patterns. For instance, in this case, uh, you can observe that the solution that is obtained uh, is not precisely a good one, but in that sense, uh, what it's done is uh, we consider, or is typically considered a total variation, a regularization term also in this case. And this total variation term uh, is responsible for improving the solution that is obtained with this subsampling. So in this left-hand side energy term, you have here the Fourier transform of the image. You have the observation in the, in the case space. And this sigma i, are either zero or one, depending of the of the fact if you sample or not at a given uh, point of the K space. Here you have a more randomized uh, sampling. You observe how the reconstruction goes. If you consider lambda equal to zero, if there is no total variation activity, and if you consider the total variation, then you get a better uh, a better reconstruction of the MRI uh, image. Finally, uh, this is an example coming from meteorology. This is the variational data simulation problem. And in this case, uh, in, in general data simulation, what you want to do is you want to reconstruct the initial condition of the dynamical system so that it matches in the dynamic, it matches the observations that you can obtain. And typically with it, the question here is uh, where to locate the stations in a, in a better way uh, so that uh, you can reconstruct the initial condition uh, optimally. So these uh, data simulation uh, problems have two different terms. The first one is, uh, is actually relating to the observation and the matching with respect to the dynamics that you can observe. This WK is either zero or one, depending on whether you observe or not at a, give, at a given geographical point. And a part of that, you have this uh, background term that is related to some previous solution that you may, may have. So you can observe in this right-hand side what happens in the same day in the, with the same type of conditions, but in this uh, upper picture, uh, the observations in the south are present, while in the lower one, there are no observations in the south of the country. And you can observe that the dynamics is quite different uh, concerning the precipitation in the, in the geography of the country. So uh, the message uh, out of this, uh, this slide is it is important uh, not only to include these regularization terms, but it's also important to, to find the right values or the optimal values for these parameters in the case of the, of the regularization terms and hyperparameters in the sense of sampling so that we can obtain a better reconstruction of the, of the solution. So how to do this? Um, we consider a, a bi-level learning approach, what we call a bi-level learning approach, and it presupposes actually is a combination of a data-driven and a model-based approach, and it considers actually the existence of a training set of uh, ground truth solutions and uh, corrupted data solutions uh, that we can compare or learn from. And the idea of the bi-level learning problem is uh, to consider a, a minimization problem that matches actually the reconstructions that you want to obtain with respect to the to the ground truth uh, solution, and this is done by basically by using a loss function in this uh, in this upper part. And what you want to consider as the uh, optimization variables are actually the parameters or hyperparameters that are present in the model. But the special feature about these bi-level learning problems is the fact that the, the constraint is is provided by another optimization problem. 
uh, in this case, considering the energy that was uh, written before. So you have, again, the regularization term in the data fidelity model. So you have a minimization problem involved as a, or a, as a constraint of another optimization problem. And this is the so-called bi-level structure that, uh, that we consider. So basically, the data-driven uh, factor is provided by this, uh, this learning uh, function that you consider this loss function. And of course, the model is involved in the inverse, in the inverse problem. So what's the advantage of this type of, uh, of bi-level learning approach is the fact that the operator that is involved in the data fidelity term may be linear, non-linear, uh, non-local, or a PDE solution operator. You can write down uh, in any of these cases the bi-level learning problem. Um, R is typically a strongly convex uh, term. This, this energy is typically strongly convex, but may be a non-smooth function. And this, the parameter lambda may be, as we saw before, maybe a scalar, maybe a vector, a function, a sampling strategy, or any other thing uh, that you may consider in this, in this setting. So uh, how to deal with these bi-level learning problems is, uh, is the question, right? So uh, first, let me start with the with a simplified setting, which are the linear inverse problems. And uh, let me consider just for, for illustration, what happens with a single training pair. And uh, what you do here is you minimize with respect to the parameter and hyperparameter lambda, and uh, you match the solution with the ground truth solution. And uh, you put a constraint, the constraint is a minimization problem again. And uh, this minimization problem in this case is a quadratic, has a quadratic type term with a linear operator involved and also this convex, uh, this convex energy or convex regularization term. Now, if the operator T is linear and uh, this energy is uh, smooth, basically strongly convex and smooth, then what you typically do is you replace the lower level problem uh, by the necessary and sufficient optimality condition. So um, in this case, as we have the convexity, we can just simply replace uh, the condition and we obtain actually a single level formulation where we want to match the ground truth signal. And a part of that, it is uh, restricted by a system of, uh, of equations. And in this case, um, of course, the whole optimization questions uh, are quite standard to, to answer. Uh, first of all, the optimal solutions of both problems, and that this can be proved, uh, coincide thanks to the convexity of the lower level energy and also the, to the fact that there are no mixed constraints. But a part of that, uh, you can obtain the existence of Lagrange multipliers for this type of single level formulation, just depending on the features of the operator T and also on the features of the of this uh, smooth regularization term. So this is the ideal scenario. You replace the lower level with some equation, for instance, and this equation can be uh, treated uh, with known techniques. And, and this, is, uh, this is the special feature of these linear inverse problems. Now, what happens if uh, R is a non-smooth uh, regularization term or T is a non-linear operator? So uh, let me just uh, briefly uh, review some uh, bibliography concerning, concerning this uh, type of approach. So the first ideas uh, related to linear inverse problems were developed by uh, Eldad Haber and, and uh, Tenorio in 2003. And uh, they actually uh, provided some numerical experiments, a proof of concept that this works in many of the situations, but it was actually the, the pioneering work concerning a uh, bi-level learning. Then in 2009, around, around this year, uh, this bi-level learning uh, philosophy entered the field of, uh, of image processing uh, by using this, this specific type of approach in, by, for learning Markov random field model parameters. And uh, in this specific case, uh, the problem is differentiable. So it was, it was also possible to do a replacement similar to the one that I presented before. Uh, we started working in 2012 uh, with the bi-level learning approach, but uh, for non-smooth total variation regular, regularizers and provided some analytical results as well as numerical for this type of tasks. 
and uh, thereafter the the field kind of exploded with a lot of uh, references uh, related basically uh, with image processing combining different type of regularization terms a uh, different type of models uh, imaging applications as well and um, more recently uh, in 2000 2017 uh, this uh, approach was considered for inverse problems for the estimation of coefficients and also for data assimilation problems in the case of sampling uh, the observations so let me briefly uh, go to the inverse problems in imaging and uh, in this case uh, what you have in the total variation in problems is you have the noisy image f uh, and you want to get the clean one in this case is only about the imaging and you also consider in this case an energy model and this energy model it, it relates to different terms the one is the data fidelity and the data fidelity as we saw before matches the corrupted image uh, with respect to the one that you want to recover. This is a specific type of quadratic term is related to the Gaussian noise uh, that is present in the image, if you know that in advance. And uh, we use the isotropic total variation regularizer for uh, enforcing sparsity in this case of the gradient of the image. So this is just the Euclidean norm for, the, for each pixel of the image. So you have the Euclidean norm of the partial derivatives with respect to X and to Y. And this has the same effect as the L1 norm typically does, and it enforces sparsity on the vector that is that is going inside. So what it's typically obtained, if you consider this type of regularization term, is you obtain a solution where K of U is uh, zero in most or many parts of the image. So you recover in this sense piecewise constant solutions uh, for your for your problem. So the energy model combines these two terms, the data fidelity on one hand, and also the regularization term on the other, and you have to choose uh, the lambda i's in a clever way so that you can uh, obtain a better reconstruction. This is an example of what happens with a signal. <clears throat> with a simple signal, it's very noisy. You can observe the gray, the gray signal. And uh, by using this type of uh, total variation term, you recover a signal that preserves the important jams or the structural jams of the signal, but get rid get rid of the noise that is present in this in this part. So um, there are other types of regularization terms in imaging. Uh, one of those is the anisotropic total variation, and in this case, uh, similar to the previous uh, type of regularizer. Um, there is the L1 norm of the different partial derivatives in the different pixels of the image, and this L1 norm also enforces the sparsity uh, that we saw before, uh, enforcing the fact that you want to obtain also piecewise constant solution. Now, uh, there are some drawbacks of this type of total variation regularizers, and uh, this is basically the main one is called the staircasing effect and uh, is provoking the, by the fact that you want to recover a piecewise constant solution so if you have a smooth gray variation of the image uh, then you can you recover actually a so-called staircase a so-called staircase in this in this case right so uh, as a remedy to this type of uh, situations uh, higher order uh, regularizers uh, were considered and in this case also sparsity is involved but now uh, in this type of total generalized variation regularizers for instance you have two different terms in the regularization part and the one is uh, you include an additional variable w which is matching actually the gradient of u but a part of that you get the symmetrized gradient of this artificial uh, artificial variable so uh, by using this last term, you enforce the sparsity on the deformation. And that means you try to preserve a uh, smooth intensity variation. So you get reconstructions which are uh, basically piecewise linear. And this is for certain type of images, the right uh, object to consider. But of course, based on that, you can obtain different types and, and, and other types of regularizers uh, for reconstructing your image, depending on the applications you have at hand. But the most important fact is 
that most imaging regularizers are non-smooth, they are non-differentiable, uh, related to the absolute value of the, or the Euclidean norm, and they enforce in some type of way, they enforce sparsity. So uh, differently from the linear type of, uh, of inverse problems now, uh, with this type of regularization, you have a non-smooth type of problem. This is an example of what happens with the reconstruction with different types of uh, regularization terms. So you have the noisy image on this uh, on this uh, upper part. You can observe how damaged or corrupted this image is. Uh, you can observe on the right hand side the total variation reconstruction. And if you consider, for instance, the black and white zones in the reconstructions is quite are, is quite good. But if you consider the intensity variations, you can observe that you have some uh, some staircasing already going on in this part. So you have a non, not really so smooth variation of the intensity between black and white or white and black in this part. Now, you can, if you consider a total variation of second order, then you get a lot of blur. And if you consider the total generalized variation, then you can obtain a good reconstruction of the intensity variations, which was the purpose actually of this type of regularization. So uh, what happens now um, if we consider the bi-level learning approach with the total variation, and we consider that in an, in an image processing setting, um, as you recall, um, we have the loss function on the upper level, and the loss function relates to the, the solution that you want to obtain, the image that you want to obtain with a ground truth image that you may have in advance. This is the, the basic assumption of the problem. And you want to tune the parameters uh, lambda so that you get a better reconstruction. Now, the problem is you have as constraint again a minimization problem. This minimization problem uh, has a very nice term, a quadratic one uh, as the first one, but a part of that you have in this second part a convex term, but it's not a differentiable, uh, a differentiable term. So uh, since you have convexity, even if, the, if you don't have the differentiability, you can uh, replace the lower level with a so-called uh, primal dual necessary and sufficient optimality condition. And this primal dual uh, condition has uh, three types of relations. The first one, which is the quiet, uh, the easy one, which is uh, just a linear one concerning the, the U and this additional multiplier or dual multiplier Q. And um, a part of that, you have uh, some non-smooth relations that are involved in this uh, pixel-wise manner. And the first one is the Euclidean norm of the gradient of the image in the pixel, and also the scalar product between this, uh, this gradient and the dual multiplier. And a part of that, you have that the dual, that the dual has a Euclidean norm, which is smaller or equal than one. Now, um, Standard constraint qualifications, con qualification conditions do not hold in this case, and you cannot prove the existence of Lagrange multiplier. If you just replace this minimization problem with these three types of relations, uh, you preserve the non-smoothness in these two Euclidean norm terms that you have here. And so you cannot use standard or uh, differentiable optimization techniques for getting the existence of Lagrange multipliers. So uh, different tools are required to, to being able to analyze this type of problems. So let me uh, review some literature concerning that. Uh, so we started, as I mentioned before, uh, considering the total variation. Uh, Kunish and Pock also in the same year considered the, the anisotropic version of the total variation as well. Uh, what it was done actually was consider a uh, consistency of the regularization. So the non-smooth term was regularized, and then we applied uh, the different type of differentiable optimization techniques to this regularization. And then at the end, we perform an asymptotic analysis to get some conditions on the limit. Uh, this was uh, thereafter uh, extended to total generalized variation cases uh, by our group and also by the group of Michael Hintermüller in, in Berlin. And uh, we provided there uh, some asymptotic results, uh, structural properties, and also some solution algorithms for this type of bilevel problems. Uh, there are several extensions that you can you can consider, like spatially dependent parameters, 
mixed noise models, non-local models, and, and other type of variational is sort of models that arise in image processing. And uh, the problem was thereafter consider these these three uh, bullets in this first uh, part uh, were considering actually the uh, infinite dimensional models. And uh, these infinite dimensional models uh, were very complicated to analyze. And so um, what was done actually thereafter was considering a finite dimensional analysis where the non-smooth properties of the operators uh, were more straightforward to analyze uh, with two types of techniques. The first one is the so-called Bulligan differentiability of the solution operator, which allows to characterize sub-differentials and being able to to characterize also the solutions or the minima of these type of problems. And a part of that is some variation and analysis techniques based on the Mordukovic uh, or the Mordukovic methodology, which leads to a Mordukovic stationarity of the optimal values. Now you can obtain or you can apply this type of techniques to finite dimensions, but it's not possible to do it in infinite dimensions. And uh, of course, if you have some properties about solution operator and, and some optimality conditions, then you may design different types of numerical methods. Now, the questions here in this, this whole amount of work, it was done for a specific type of, uh, of models. So if for a total variation model, then you have to invest a lot of energy to, to get some analysis for the total generalized variation as well, and so on and so on. So uh, there was significant effort to, to, to carry out the analysis for each specific prior, which was not the ideal uh, scenario. So uh, what we have done in the recent years uh, was to develop a unifying framework for dealing with uh, all of those uh, non-smooth uh, sparsity-based uh, imaging models and try to obtain some, some sort of properties for, for dealing with those. And the, the basic idea is the following one. So as you may recall, uh, we had in the total variation case, uh, the upper level loss function, which relates the solution with the ground truth. Uh, we have to choose the, the lambda uh, in an optimal way. And the constraint is provided by this minimization problem again, where you have the data fidelity model and also the Euclidean norm of the gradient of the image in, in each pixel uh, considered uh, considering the isotropic version of the total variation. And as we mentioned before, you can replace this lower level problem with these three types of relations, which are in the primal dual system. And uh, you have, again, the non-smooth part in these two uh, specific norms. But these have a specific and very nice feature. And it's the fact that if you consider these two, uh, these two types of relation, then uh, you can relate this with some sort of a cosinus, uh, cosinus formula for the angle between the vectors. So uh, you can observe what happens uh, graphically. If you have k of u in a certain pixel, if the gradient of the image in a certain pixel is different from zero, then uh, you from this, from this uh, simple equation, this inequality, you obtain that you have a collinearity of these two vectors. So QI and K of UI are collinear. Of course, the, the QI is equal to one in that case, since you have a, a direct solution of this uh, upper equation. Uh, this is called the inactive set, where which are the pixels where the gradient of the image is different from zero. But also in the case of the active set, where the gradient is equal to zero and the multiplier is smaller than one, then you have, of course, since the one is zero, the other one may be whatever you want, as long as it is uh, smaller than one. And in the biactive set, which is the set where the gradient vanishes and also the multiplier is equal to one in norm, then you have also a collinearity since the k of u is equal to zero. So in all three possible cases, you have the collinearity of the vectors. <laughs> And since you have this collinearity, then you can uh, actually introduce a change of variables uh, using basically a trigonometric uh, type of, uh, of relation. So you can leave the problem. Uh, we include more variables. We leave the primal dual system. 
And uh, since we include the radius here and also an angle in this in this part, we uh, increase the number of variables that are involved. But we observed before that we have collinearity, so the angles may be or are the same in this in these cases. And since we have this collinearity and these changes of variables, then you can actually introduce or replace this QI inside this Euclidean norm and also uh, in this uh, in this uh, here and you can obtain simply replacing these relations you can obtain actually a so-called complementarity system so the radius have to be a uh, greater or equal than zero and uh, a part of that uh, and a part of that uh, you have to consider that uh, if r is greater than zero, then delta uh, should be equal to one and also the other way around. So this is a standard complementarity type uh, of system that you have in this part. Now, if, which is the good news about that is that uh, you can reformulate then uh, using this lifting and this, uh, this additional formulation, you can reformulate the bi-level problem as a so-called mathematical program with complementarity constraints. So now you have a single level formulation, you have the loss function, you have the first uh, equation of the optimality condition, you have the changes of variables, and you have a part of that, this complementarity system, which is provided in red in this, in this part. And the good thing is that uh, now you have a huge toolbox uh, of uh, techniques uh, specific for this type of problems. You have constraint qualifications, conditions, which are specifically developed for MPCCs, stationarity concepts, second order sufficient and necessary optimality conditions, some structural properties of the solution, but also a bunch of uh, numerical methods for solving this type of problems. And of course, there are many contributors to this field uh, along the last uh, 20 years, uh, basically. So um, what uh, What's good about this, or the first consequence, is that the, the bi-level learning problems for non-smooth uh, sparsity-based priors uh, may be reformulated as mathematical programs with complementarity constraints. And it didn't matter, or it doesn't matter, if it's a total variation or the total generalized variation. All of those can be considered within the same framework. And uh, a part of that, uh, since you have a specific or tailored uh, constraint qualifications conditions for these type of problems, then uh, you can prove uh, that the solutions are either aim stationary points or strong stationary points, which is strong stationarity is basically the, the KKT type of conditions that you may know from nonlinear optimization. And uh, a part of that, you can prove also second order sufficiency, stability of the points, and you can observe or you can apply a different type of algorithms uh, incorporated in MPCC solvers, either commercial or not. And this can be applied to different type of applications that, uh, that arise in image processing. So this is a, the example, the specific example of what happens in MRI. So as, as you may remember, in this case, there were two things that had to be chosen. So the first one is the parameter uh, that is a uh, that is uh, accompanying the total variation term. And a part of that, the sampling strategy has to be chosen as well. Now, in this, uh, in this case, the sampling strategy has endpoints, and this is the ideal scenario of what you want to solve. Now, in this case, you have, of course, uh, a mixed uh, integer nonlinear program, since you have to choose uh, the sigma either zero or one. So what we did in this case uh, was to consider a, a complex relaxation of this of this set and a part of that a penalization term that is provoking that uh, that the different the different uh, numbers go either to zero or to one to obtain the desired type of uh, of solution um, that is involved there and for this type of application we also regularize the total variation with a Hoover version of it so that we can uh, we could apply in standard nonlinear optimization large-scale nonlinear optimization methods to these type of problems. So this is an example of, of what uh, was obtained in our case. So you can observe in this left-hand uh, picture, 
uh, what happened with our learn uh, pattern of the sampling and uh, compared to other which were uh, considered at this at those times also in uh, in the medical applications and uh, you can observe in this number this is related to the quality of the reconstruction and you can observe that our optimally chosen sampling strategy uh, outperformed the other ones were that we compare with. So uh, let me go to the variational data simulation problem. And in this case, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the variational data simulation methods uh, try to reconstruct the initial condition of a given dynamical system. So uh, this is basically developed or mostly developed for, uh, for weather forecasting. And the variable that you want to, to reconstruct is the variable u, which is present here, which is the initial condition. And uh, a part of that, uh, you have uh, the dynamical system, which is provided by this, uh, this sort of equation, which can be or a system of PDEs, uh, mostly used in a discretized uh, way. And what you, are, what you do is actually you compare in different geographical points uh, the solution that you observe at, at a given geographical point and at a given time, you compare this with an observation you may have of the atmosphere. And uh, this, uh, this term is compensated with so-called the uh, error covariance matrix. And a part of that, you have an initial value uh, solution that you may recover, for instance, from the global uh, weather forecasting. And you try to match also uh, weighted by this background covariance matrix, also this initial condition. So this is the typical uh, data simulation problem. This is um, actually the inverse problem that we, we consider in this case. And the dynamical problem uh, incorporates observations in a given time window and uh, also takes into account the dynamics, uh, the nonlinear dynamics uh, operator M. So uh, the resulting nonlinear operator is, uh, is this T equal uh, H composed with M. And the reconstruction depends, of course, on the number and quality uh, and location of the of observations. And the idea here is to optimally decide which is the sampling strategy that has to be used. So this is an example of uh, what happened uh, at a given day in, in 2018. Uh, with the weather forecasting that we did at that day in Quito. And uh, this on this left hand side, you can observe uh, what happened with the forecast, uh, incorporating the observations from the airport in Quito. And on the right hand side is the forecast without those observations. So you can uh, realize that uh, the forecast here was heavy rain in the city, while in this part, uh, the forecast was about uh, not raining at all. In, in the in Quito. And what happened actually in that day was that the, there were 214 uh, emergency calls because uh, the weather was so heavy and the rain was so heavy that uh, it was it was really a risky kind of situation and the, the services, the emergency services had to attend several kind of uh, difficulties for that day. So the idea is you have to clever you have to be clever about to choosing to choose the the location of where to observe and when to observe to get better uh, a better reconstruction so the bi level uh, problem uh, is considering again a training set in this case uh, you have ground truth uh, initial condition ground truth uh, system states and uh, you want to estimate of course the initial condition of the dynamical system now the upper level problem uh, is considering um, a loss function that relates the solution with the ground truth. And in the lower level problem, you have the data simulation again. So you have these two level type of structure uh, for another time. Now the W is a, a zero one binary variable. So as in the same way as we did with the MRI, uh, we, um, relax this integrality constraint, we convexify the set, and a part of that we incorporated another type of penalty term to be able to solve uh, the problem numerically. And uh, of course, this is a much more uh, involved type of problem as you have a nonlinear and a heavy, highly nonlinear operator that is involved in the constraint of the lower level problem. 
And uh, since you have this type of nonlinearity, you don't have any convexity of this lower level problem. And you have to, you cannot simply replace the lower level by the necessary optimality conditions, as these are not sufficient for the, for the problem you consider. So um, the main features about this is the sampling strategies uh, consist of binary design variables. We, as we mentioned, they, we relax that for this type of problems. The data simulation problem is highly nonlinear. You cannot just replace with a KKT system. And uh, as an alternative, what we, we did and also some, some other researchers was to consider some sort of a local behavior, local convex behavior of the of the problem to be able to as at least locally to replace the the lower level problem with some optimality conditions and, and try to move uh, forward. Now what happens if you consider PDEs for instance so in function spaces if you consider the, the lower level problem with the PDEs uh, uh, as, as, as the dynamic then what you typically obtain as you have a pointwise observations in in, in space is a, an adjoint system that has Borel uh, measures on the right-hand side, and you have to work with the quite low regularity spaces for getting some, some sort of analysis. And uh, what we are currently uh, starting to work with is the design of optimal sampling strategies in the case of a satellite data simulation. So let me jump uh, finally to the conclusions. Um, so what uh, was the idea and I tried to present it uh, was uh, a device level learning approach as a combination or a hybrid type of approach within the machine learning family that relates data driven on one hand and model based approaches on the other. And the, the goal is to choose the optimal parameters and the sampling strategies uh, in variational inverse problems, either imaging, data simulation or any other that you may have. Now, in the ideal scenario, which is the case of the linear inverse problems, then the lower level problem may be replaced by the necessary and sufficient optimality condition. Then you update the single level formulation and the things are uh, more standard in that case. And you can obtain or you can apply different well-known techniques. Now, for imaging uh, problems, uh, different type of tools have to be employed. The first ones, uh, variational analysis, non-smooth analysis, to get some sort of a KKT systems or efficient solution algorithms. And what I presented here uh, with this uh, unifying framework that uh, by lifting the primal dual system, it leads to a mathematical program with complementarity constraints that can be analyzed uh, and uh, some optimality conditions can be obtained in that, in that case uh, for characterizing the optimal values. And a part of that, a uh, device level learning approach for a uh, sampling and, or sensor placement, which is another name, is also a natural framework for dealing with lower level problems that are highly nonlinear, uh, which is what happens, for instance, in four dimensional variational data simulation. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any, any questions. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, now we have uh, time for some questions. Uh, you can uh, switch on your microphone or you can uh, uh, write that as you want, as you prefer. Is there any question? Okay, I have some question. Uh, the question is the following. Uh, uh, you have presented in by level uh, formulation of, uh, of the problems, uh, uh, an optimization problem in which the, the, the variable uh, uh, is uh, itself the solution of another optimization problem. Okay, and this is the, the reason it is called the by level uh, uh, problem, of course. So uh, my question is, if uh, would it be uh, interesting to consider a problem in which the variable is not the solution of the minimization problem, but 
uh, a kind of equilibria, a, a kind of equilibrium for several uh, uh, functions. I mean, uh, you you to minimize something uh, in which the variable is, uh, for, for example, a Pareto equilibria for two uh, different costs. Uh, it could be the case if you have, uh, for instance, two images that do not coincide and you want to uh, optimize uh, something, uh, the image uh, that you think that is correct, uh, taking into account how, uh, both images and knowing that uh, uh, there are uh, mistakes, uh, there are really uh, perturbations, uh, important perturbations in, in, in both of them. Yeah, well, um, I don't know exactly uh, what kind of uh, problem you may may have to consider in that case, as, uh, as you mentioned. So I, I have the impression that uh, there is a lot related to the type of loss function that you use, since you have this, uh, this, uh, this sort of conflicted uh, goals that you may want to consider. So uh, this loss function is, is a quantity that has to be chosen widely. Uh, that's, that, that's true. And uh, of course, in the lower level, that's a different that's a different story because uh, we consider. I mean, it's complicated enough for us to consider this this sort of uh, inverse problems in this variational approach. But for instance, if you have several type of minimization problems, since you you talk about equilibria, for instance, uh, I don't know if you can extend that straightforwardly. It can be considered, it can be written down for sure, but uh, I would have to, to invest some time to, to provide you a, a more precise answer on, on whether that, that could have uh, some future. Okay, okay, one, thank you. One question, Professor Cara, I would like to ask. Okay, okay. To okay, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Professor De Lurie, uh, I am I am interested in the problem of the application for the development in area de desarrollo. No? Uh, I would like to know uh, how, how, how is the data for the problem of the RAIN. And then my second question is, if you have collinearity problem, uh, is this, is this a, a solution with with neural ne network, uh, because the problem in the collinearity is is solved. Is 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 a is is a problem uh, in neural 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 Justamente el perceptrón multicapa, no, eh, sería, yo considero que, bueno, eh, veo que esa es una alternativa a pues, ese problema que usted estaba planteando. Supongo que en la data que usted va a desarrollar, por ejemplo, el problema de la lluvia, si existe un problema de, de multicolinealidad, si usted lo enfoca ya en problemas de redes neuronales, ya no existiría ¿no? Es, ese obstáculo. Por eso me gustaría saber eh, cómo es la data, la data que usted ha usado en problemas de las lluvias ¿Cómo ha sido el pronóstico? O, eh, ¿cuál es la, ¿Cómo ha sido realmente la, la data y qué pronóstico ha conseguido? Y si ha tenido problemas de multicolonialidad. Porque en problemas de regresión logística binaria sí existe ese problema. ¿no? Y no sé si la técnica que usted está considerando también ayudaría a superar para el caso de la, de la regresión logística binaria o múltiple. ¿no? no sé si me entendió la pregunta, profesor de los Reyes. La entendí. Um, I will try to answer that uh, the worst way possible in, in English. So um, concerning the data simulation problem, uh, actually, so you asked several questions, so I, I hope I, I answer most of them. So the, the data that we use is actually based on the on stations of the airports. Uh, we don't measure rain. Rain is just the output that you, we provide, but uh, this is not what we observe actually for assimilating. And that should be clear. So typically what it's done, what is assimilated in our case so far are winds or temperature or humidity and things like that, but not the rain itself. Um, the problem actually is that we consider, as I mentioned, just the airport stations because uh, what happens in the global south differently from what occurs, for instance, in Europe or the US, 
is that we don't have many many of those stations and uh, the assimilation process is quite complicated with such uh, an amount of few observations. Um, we used actually, I'm, I'm not a statistician, so uh, we don't uh, analyze the correlations in the, in the variables themselves. We use for those the standard packages that are in the, in the software that we use for the weather forecasting. Uh, but but uh, as I mentioned, so uh, we have few data that we have to assimilate each day. And this is why uh, we want to consider actually the safe satellite data uh, to be able to assimilate more information and get uh, improved forecasts of the weather. The collinearity that I spoke about uh, was more related to the conversion of the, of the system and the variables and to transform the problem in another one. Uh, but it's not related to the to the statistics of the of the data that we use actually. Okay, and thank you, Professor. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Professor Karam. Uh, thanks again. Uh, is there is there any other question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Karam, uh, uh, you can uh, ask question. Okay. Well, uh, we are going to we are going to, we are going to uh, you okay. Uh, There's a question there. If I may ask a question, oh, sure. yeah. Uh, well, so first of all, thank you very much for, uh, I mean, Juan Carlos for this very, very interesting talk. Um, I have just a little question, uh, just to understand the issue of the, uh, of the data simulation, uh, the motivation, uh, because I don't know the, I don't know the problem. So if I understood it correctly, um, you you have stations and you get uh, certain kind of variables. And uh, um, of course, these are only partial observation with respect to the complete field of variables that you can produce with your uh, meteorological model, say. But if I understood it correctly, this is aimed at reconstructing the initial data. And, uh, and those variables are taken at subsequent times, if I understood correctly your formulation. Uh, so what is the interest? Uh, I mean, uh, you, you, want, you want to use observation at say day one, day two, day three, in order to reconstruct the initial data at time D0. Can you just tell me what is the interest? Thanks. Uh, improve the weather forecasting. This is this is the basic uh, the basic uh, idea of the data simulation, right? Since you cannot you cannot observe the initial condition because you have the initial condition of the different points of the grid. So you cannot observe, observe that directly. What you have as initial condition is a uh, two type of so one source is the global data that you, or the global simulations that you obtain from different agencies. Uh, for instance, the US or Europe, they develop on a daily basis a, a weather forecast, which is around the globe. And this so this is, is your a, UB, UB variable? Exactly. Right. exactly. This is the background information you have. And right. a part of that, you improve this background information with the observations that, uh, that you measure on the yeah. different stations. And with those two sources, then you reconstruct the initial condition and you improve the forecast. That's the basic idea. Yeah, I mean, this is perfectly fine and understand it. But the point for me is the time lag in the sense that uh, uh, you reconstruct the initial condition, say, at day zero, uh, when uh, that was missing, say. Uh, but, but, but for doing that, you have to take observation at day one, two, three, or four, say just to make an example. So those initial conditions will then be used to simulate or maybe for a longer time. Exactly. Oh, now I understand. Exactly, right. the horizon is the basic idea, exactly. Uh -huh. So you, okay. you okay. simulate on one day, but then you improve for 72 very hours, clear. let's say. Very clear, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> that was clear. Okay, thank you again. Uh, so uh, uh, is there any question, any additional question? Last chance. Oh, okay. okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Juan Carlos. Muchas gracias y, uh, por tu excelente charla. Y, y I am going to, to end the session. Uh, there will be Juan Limaco for uh, the last words. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, thank you, Enrique. Uh, thank you a lot, Professor Juan Carlos de los Reyes, for your excellent talk. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your attendance, and see you in two weeks. Uh, on Friday, lecture by Professor Alfio Quarteroni and Professor Juan Carlos de los Reyes will be posted on our YouTube channel, uh, certainly with uh, the permission. Uh, Enrique, has anything to add?
Don't uh, thank you very much uh, and see you in two weeks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.